Hello, and welcome to the OIST podcast, bringing you the latest in science and tech from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. Today we speak with Professor Tom Froze. Tom is a cognitive scientist with a background in computer science and complex systems, and he's now leading the Embodied Cognitive Science Unit here at OIST. Where traditional approaches to studying the mind tend to think about the brain as an isolated computer detached from its environment, the Embodied Cognitive Science Unit thinks about cognition in an interactive way. That is, thinking about cognition as a process involving agents interacting with their environment and studying the role of those interactions in the human mind. In this conversation, we talk about the successes and limitations of thinking about brains in isolation before exploring what embodied cognitive science can reveal about the mind. We discuss what this research looks like in a laboratory setting, including what happens when human participants meet in a virtual space. Finally, we consider the implications of this work beyond academia and what it reveals about collectivist cultures like Japan. It was a great conversation and I look forward to seeing what comes out of the unit once their new laboratory toys are up and running. Enjoy. Tom Froes, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. To begin, on a personal level, what was it that first captured your attention to this research space? When I was a teenager and I used to enjoy playing computer games, back then one of the things that frustrated me was that you could usually trick the, the AI in the game quite easily. Mm. And it would just show that it didn't understand really what the game was about. So I thought, well, why not try to create some better AI? And um, that basically got me then to university studying computer science, cybernetics, AI, robotics. Through that degree, uh, I came to realize that actually we still don't properly understand natural intelligence either. So that kind of was like the beginning of uh, my, my interest in research. And natural intelligence... Before we get to the embodied cognitive science side of things, what's been the prevailing wisdom until this point? Okay, well, studying the mind has a, a very long tradition, right? Uh, in, the, in the West, uh, usually we think back to the ancient Greeks and, um, you know, Aristotle or, 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 you know, famous philosophers like that. And so, to some extent, the mind has been a topic for a long time, I've written, and, um, but in, in those years when I was at the university, most people thought about intelligence as manipulating symbols in some kind of clever uh, rule-based way. And um, that seemed to be true for many of the things we were actually doing in class. You know, so it's funny, we were kind of describing our own uh, research practices to some extent. We were working with number systems, uh, doing equations and so on. But uh, it seemed like that to generalize those practices to animals and so on uh, was a bit of a stretch and so uh, maybe that's where some of the problems lie with uh, trying to generate some of the AI in a, a naturalistic way. And then moving on from some of those mm -hmm. ancient philosophers into the modern day, now we live in a world with computers. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's shaped how we think about the mind mm -hmm. and that's ourselves. True. And, you know, on that long journey that you, you alluded to, uh, one of the key figures is uh, René Descartes, uh, the French philosopher who to some extent was also the, one of the founding fathers of a modern scientific method. And uh, in order for him to get science to, you know, to work and be accepted, um, he had to separate the mind from the world and put it in some other realm. Uh, you know, that was then the church business to some extent. Mm. And so actually the advances of the sciences, of the, the natural sciences, was bought at the cost of losing sight of what mind uh, could mean in such a naturalistic paradigm. Um, this idea that uh, maybe we're symbol manipulators or computers, we would call them now, as you, as you mentioned, has a little bit of heritage of, of this idea that um, um, actually maybe what cognition is, is like, you know, the manipulation of abstract ideas, right? And so that's, you know, removed from the messy stuff that happens in the world, basically. And so the problem there is that, um, like I said, in the games that I was playing, just to go back to that example, it doesn't seem to be very good at um, creating systems that understand uh, their interactions in the way that we would or that an, an animal would. And uh, although they can appear very clever sometimes, uh, usually they are very limited in their domain of applicability. Um, they have to have well-defined rule sets to work with. Uh, 
And if you put them out of that context, uh, very quickly they they drastically fail. And so that's that's a bit strange. Um, so organisms are usually much more robust and adaptable than that. Yeah, and if you take a human and put them into an unfamiliar environment, mm-hmm. for instance, they're not just going to completely collapse. But right, there's some degradation. Some they can they can bounce back. They can reorganize. They can they can learn. They can adapt. And of course, there are limits to this. I mean, if you just take an organism out of its niche and put it somewhere else, it'll mm. you know probably not thrive as it would in its normal habitat. But let's just say that some of the simple tricks that we can fool our AI with uh, by just asking him, what is that? And it'll tell you a gibbon, and then you add a bit of noise in there in the image, and then suddenly it will tell you that it's a nematode worm, or I don't know, some something like that, where you basically see that there's no understanding on the side of the system. It's recognizing some some patterns that it's encountered in the past, but those patterns are totally abstract. They don't have any content. I mean, the system doesn't know what those patterns are about, to put it in a different way. And that seems to be the trick that uh, life and uh, and mind has solved. We don't only see patterns. We know what those patterns are about. And um, so far, if we have a, had a hard time replicating that aboutness, if you want to call it, in artificial media. So you're now attempting to move into a space where cognition is thought about in a wider sense. Yeah, that's right. So maybe the problem why we don't uh, find understanding of patterns in artificial systems is because the cognition that they perform is so detached from the world in which they find themselves in. So we have a system that the only thing it can do is manipulate abstract symbols based on a set of rules, um, you know, do some kind of information processing, to put it in general terms, uh, then it doesn't really have any direct engagement with the, the world around it. It's just like uh, locked up in uh, some kind of like digital world, right? And so our idea in this unit is to say, well, maybe we can do things differently if we think of cognition uh, more in an interactive way. We think about it as uh, an organism engaging with an environment and then look at those interactions as that's where the cognition is happening. It's not happening... You know, as Descartes would say, in a different realm, you know, with a different substance. Now we don't agree with that anymore, but we're still putting it on this pedestal of abstract mathematical formalisms. But what if it's in the messiness of uh, bodies and uh, environment and stuff and materiality and historicity and all of that? And uh, maybe that's where cognition uh, can be found. And that's very hard to replicate in AI. And so maybe, you know, there are two sides of this coin. On the one hand, it might help us to better understand natural intelligence, but also the failures of artificial intelligence. It seems like a very intuitive idea mm-hmm. based on our own experience as people. Mm-hmm. The idea that cognition is influenced by mm-hmm. the environment around you, the other people around you. Mm-hmm. Why do you think there's resistance to this idea? I think everybody would agree that uh, cognition is influenced by um, the environment and by other people. But influence uh, can mean many things, right? Mm-hmm. And influence in particular can mean that the, it's providing just an extra source of inputs. So, for example, many people think about, uh, who are agreeing with this idea of information processing, think that culture provides just extra information to be processed, right? But to some extent, that means that the brain or whatever is the machinery is running these processes remains separate from and independent from these cultural processes, it's just you know taking the input and doing something with it, but it's not being transformed by its embeddedness in that mm-hmm. social cultural context. So we want to push that a little bit further. We want to say that um, the interactions we have with our environment are not just sources of input or you know like uh, external outputs produced by an internal process, but we want to say that the mind really extends into those interactions. They are expressions of mind, um, and that's a little bit of a more radical move. So. We want to say that the behavior is not just a product of cognition, but is part of the process of cognition. So doing is thinking to some extent in this view. Even that seems fairly intuitive as well. I mean, if this is an example that's relevant, but Mm -hmm. spouses who've lived together for 50 years Mm -hmm. where you're quite literally outsourcing Mm -hmm. parts of your brain to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I do think that what we're saying to some extent fits much better with uh, everyday human experience. And, and that's partially why I find it so attractive. Um, you know, much has been made about this gap between science and, and, and daily life that, uh, you know, maybe science is on an ivory tower somewhere completely locked off and what it has to say might be a bit divorced from the experiential reality of people struggling to pay their bills. 
And to some extent, that's true. And, and if our idea of the mind is basically that it's just a number cruncher of some kind, then I, I'm not surprised that some people find that alienating, right? And, uh, and so we're really trying to recover a more intuitive sense of what mind might mean and cash that out, uh, not only in intuitive terms, but also in scientific terms. And the example you bring up, which is, um, you know, uh, long-term sustained social relationships is, is perfect. So I completely agree. And actually part of the work we're going to do here is precisely to look at those interactions and try to see whether we can capture what the interactions between people do in terms of transforming them and allowing them to, as you say, outsource part of their cognitive processes into each other. And so that, you know, people will complete each other's sentences. They will know what the other's going to say before they say it. You can remind them of things that they might have forgotten. Um, you can anticipate uh, things in a you know, super fluid, real-time manner. Uh, you don't have to consciously reflect about what they might think because you're already somehow attuned to each other. Now, if you wanted to explain all of that just by looking at an isolated brain as a you know, information processing engine that just receives inputs and produces some outputs, it would be quite difficult. But if you instead look at the, the interaction as a complex system that has several components which includes two people, which are reciprocally influencing each other, and then we can apply some ideas from complex systems theory that asks for, uh, what happens when we have two nonlinear systems interacting. And you know, it's not unexpected that in those situations, uh, collective properties will emerge that somehow go beyond what the individuals bring to the situation. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing that we are looking at in a more systematic way. But it wasn't too long ago that people like uh, Searle, who's one of the big philosophers of mind, when he writes about collective minds, collective intentionality, was writing that in principle he could have all the social experience he has, even though he was just a brain in a vat and mm. the entire social world was just a figment of his uh, brain, like a you know massive hallucination. And so I think, and that was like in the 90s, now many less people agree with that, but you can imagine that if the leading figures in the field, uh, you know, deduce these kinds of claims from their theories, it should make us wonder about the validity of those theories. And an embodied uh, approach is uh, trying to correct this picture to some extent. It also feels a lot less isolated and a lot less sad in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, as you say, when you go in with a preconceived idea mm -hmm. that, for instance, brains are just these isolated units performing some kind of computation mm -hmm. the result of that will probably be finding things that just reinforce that idea you had in the first place but again that doesn't seem to match mm -hmm. human experience otherwise why would we interact at all yeah, right that's true i mean uh, to some extent if you looked at isolated brains you're gonna find things that isolated brains do right and um it has been fairly successful, and, and, and of course there are also states of the brain that involve less interaction, and so that's a little bit of the challenge to our view. So what do we say about imagination, dreaming, abstract thinking? So some of these capacities will are easier to explain if you assume that it's just the brain doing this and nothing else matters. Okay, so that's also an interesting kind of challenge to it. But on the other hand, we also have to think that uh, the brain has been already been a top priority for research agencies around the world, with billions of dollars being invested. And uh, we're still just, to some extent, mapping functionality. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, nobody really still has a very good idea of how we go from brain activity to mind as such. And, and maybe part of the problem of this is that we have the, the wrong approach. You know, maybe we're just, if you're trying to understand the brain, but actually it's just a component of a much larger system, then obviously a lot of the patterns that you will see in the brain will be hard to make sense of without you know, taking into account uh, all the other things that are going on. And that has direct implications for things like uh, psychiatry and so on. Um, you know, A lot of people are saying that uh, mental disorders should be thought of as uh, brain disorders. Mm -hmm. and if you think about it that way, that immediately limits the um, kind of treatments that you might consider as being worthwhile pursuing, right? Uh, then it's just a matter of trying to find the right neurotransmitters or something like that that fix the disease. And we haven't been so successful with that. Uh, I mean, depression, for example, uh, some forms are un untreatable and so on. So so maybe that is that a signal of saying that maybe we should broaden our search? You know, maybe, maybe we need to consider the mind as a more distributed system than just as a brain-based system? 
at least you know there are some interesting clues in, in these problems that the, the you know the brain centered approach is running into so effectively what you're saying is in contrast to the idea that the brain is somehow the top of a hierarchy you're almost kind of democratizing that hierarchy a little bit and that's thinking right. about the brain more in the context of some of these other things with equal weighting that's right so or maybe let's say the weighting is up for grabs you know and we'll have to work out how the weighting and maybe it depends on the situation which like when you're sleeping maybe the brain will have bigger weight than your environment you know i don't want to deny that but uh, when we're waking and we're being in interactions uh, maybe we should give equal weight you know that's uh, that's an interesting thought i mean one way of making this is intuitive is that what we're studying is patterns unfolding over time, and they can have different media. They can be your arms moving. They can be neurons firing. The things can change in your environment. Things can move around. But really what we're studying is change over time. And then if you look into the physical world and look at uh, how um, different kinds of physical relate to each other when they have different time scales, it's usually the slow ones that predominate. So when uh, you know we have the tsunami warning signs all over the place, right? Uh, when a tsunami comes in, it subsumes all the smaller waves. Even though they might be faster frequency waves, it will just, you know, uh, be dominant uh, in determining the overall shape of, of the water. Now, uh, in terms of brain activity, it's super fast activity, but that means that it should be susceptible to being enslaved by slower timescale processes, and one of those is behavior, mm -hmm. right? So the way in which you're interacting with the environment unfolds on a much slower timescale but the impact it's happening on your brain is uh, correspondingly much bigger. And in fact, so when we are now with experiments, we're planning with uh, EEG, so looking at the, the electrical activity, uh, to some extent, we have to be very careful how much movement we allow, because uh, if the participants move too much, uh, then you get a very messy signal, right? But that's just because exactly there's a, a very strong link between movement and, and brain activity. So I'm saying maybe the hierarchy should be reversed, right? So maybe it's actually uh, the brain is uh, smoothing over or adapting to the bigger waves in which we find ourselves involved in. And I guess part of the appeal for historically having the brain being the focus is that it's just easy experimentally to deal with in isolation. Mm -hmm. At least if you can get people to sit still in a scanner for mm -hmm. <laughs> however long you need them to do that. That's right. With your experimental approaches that are moving beyond simply looking at the brain, mm -hmm. how do you begin to bring in these other variables and deal with those in an experimental context? Yeah, that's a good question. And in fact, I think some of the early work was very brain-centered because, as you said, they didn't have a lot of uh, technology that would permit them to record uh, all the other things that are happening. But nowadays, uh, we have more and more options of actually recording what happens with the body and with respect to the environment at the same time as we're looking at, at the brain. And so uh, you can think of like, you know, um, these uh, suits which have uh, different markers to record the space. You can have cameras and, and, and record uh, the motion patterns from the video. The thing that, that we're doing in our unit is to draw a little bit on our computer science skills and to employ um, uh, simplified virtual reality environments uh, or human computer interfaces such that the, the movements and the sensations that people get are captured and given by a, a simple computer interface. And the advantage of doing it that way is that we can record what the people are doing and we can record what they get back, depending on what, how they move. And we can also manipulate their, in their environment in which they're interacting in a very finely controlled manner. And so in that way, we can record the brain in interaction with their body and their bodies in interaction with their environment and maybe even with other people and have this kind of holistic approach to recording uh, what goes on when people interact with each other, for example. And what have you found in those studies when you have people kind of interacting with one another in a space? Okay, so one of the exciting findings uh, coming out of this work is that uh, interaction makes a difference. Okay, and this is something that Again, might seem obvious, but like I said, most of the time interaction was just seen as an external product uh, of cognition that's happening on the inside. And it was kind of like a, you know, maybe like the exhaust coming from a car, right? It has nothing to do with the functioning of the car. It's just an external output, right? So behavior was delegated a little bit in that. But what we find here is that in moments when people are interacting in a, in a virtual space, and let's say they have a few different objects with which they can interact, uh, 
and they have to find out who is the other person, how do I, how do I feel the presence of the other person compared to the other objects, when they have this moment of felt presence there's a, that there's another person in the space with them, usually that moment of recognition happens at the same time for both people. So even though they're just interacting through a virtual reality interface and another person is connected somewhere else, when they actually meet, at that time, they have a mo moment of mutual recognition that's synchronized in, you know, in the second scale. So um, our hypothesis is that during these moments, really they have a short moment of, hey, here we are doing something, right? And this sense of we are doing something is actually realized by both of the, their brain's bodies in interaction. And what basis do we have for believing that the minds of those two participants are connected? And yeah, that's an important question. And um, the way we have investigated so far is uh, also in computational terms to get a formal understanding of the space of possible explanations. So what we have done is involve artificial agents in a similar scenario and uh, looked at what happens in their artificial brains, so to speak, during moments of mutual uh, contact. And uh, it's very interesting. What we find is that their brains start to be able to exhibit patterns of activity that are so complex that they would be impossible for the agents to realize uh, in isolation. So there's a kind of change in their uh, capacities brought about through the interaction where uh, they seem to enhance each other's degrees of freedom by going through the degrees of freedom of each that each other brings to the table, so to speak. So smashing down the ivory towers that you spoke about earlier, once we move out of the laboratory setting, mm -hmm. what are the implications of this work for society, and in particular, Japanese and Okinawan society, where we currently find ourselves? And that's a good point. Uh, much as has made, been made of the notion of a person uh, in, in Japan is much more collective than in, in, in Western society. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the collective is very highly valued here in Okinawa and in Japan more, more general. And so I think our research to some extent uh, supports these ideas and says, you know, this is not just a difference in opinion, perhaps, that, you know, maybe you can think uh, that collectives are important or not, but we can show in our experiments and in our, in our computer simulations that when we interact with each other, we transform each other and we can produce uh, collectives that uh, to some extent have a life of their own. Their dynamics go beyond what the individuals can contribute. That resonates very nicely with uh, how people here think about society. And so I look forward to exploring these ideas um, in more detail but in this particular context. So what have you got coming up next? Uh, well, uh, life is very exciting. The reason uh, we came here to OIST is to expand on our work into a more experimental direction. And uh, um, so we, we've got some uh, equipment arriving to our, to our unit. New toys. Exactly, new toys. <laughs> um, um, very nice toys that will uh, allow us to study uh, embodied real-time interaction between people. And we're going to record everything. So we're going to look at brains. We're going to look at bodies, hearts, breathing rates, your... Um, you know, how much you're sweating in your hand when you meet the other person in the virtual space. And so we're going to try to plug all of those different sensors and the, combine it with the virtuality technology and really try to have this holistic approach that will try to do justice to the complexities of uh, human social behavior. So before I let you go, we usually like to wrap things up with some quick fire questions. Okay. <laughs> Can you explain in a few simple words what it is that you do? I'm a cognitive scientist studying the role of interactions in the human mind. Beyond your own, which emerging field in science or technology most excites you? I'm uh, also very interested in artificial life, origins of life, and uh, uh, consciousness science as well. If you could wave a magic wand and erase a common misconception from everybody's collective brains relating to your research area, what would that be? I would erase people's beliefs that they're nothing but their brains. Is there a tool that you use in your work that you're particularly fond of using? Um, Slack. <laughs> I found that Slack uh, allows us to interact on a much more frequent and uh, uh, personal basis than sending emails, which can sometimes have a too formal taste to it somehow. Do you have a favorite science-related joke or fact for us? A science-related joke or fact? <laughs> 
Well, what about this one? Okay, so sometimes the same data can produce completely opposite theories. And I'll give one example. In the history of uh, life, evolution, the record, looks like there's a lot of stable forms and then there's a rapid transition to another stable form. And a lot of times people thought, well, it's just because we haven't found all the, all the fossils, you know? So there should be lots of fossils in the middle of all the transitory forms. Until someone came around and said, well, actually, maybe what's happening is that there's a lot of stasis interspaced with rapid change. And there is no continuous slow change. So they were looking at the same fossil records, but they were giving exactly opposite interpretations. So I think we should always keep that in mind uh, when we have our own cherished scientific assumptions. Tom Fraze, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Oyster Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with others who you think will enjoy it. You can also get in touch with us on Facebook and Twitter, or by sending an email to media at oist.jp. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.